The Gardner Museum incident, guys. The Gardner Museum incident, guys, refers to when 13 works of art were stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston in 1990. Now, for some backstory. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum was constructed under the guidance of art collector Isabella Stewart Gardner, a leading American art collector in the early 20th century. Her museum first opened to the public in 1903 and Gardner added to this collection until her death in 1924. When she died, she left the museum $3.5 million, as well as instructions to do not alter the collection, as well as do not buy and sell from the collection, as well as the museum shouldn't really be altered that much. This will play an important part later. Because by the 1980s, the museum's funds were running a little low. The museum didn't have climate control or even a damn insurance policy and was severely lacking in building maintenance. After the FBI uncovered a plot in 1982 of a group of local criminals attempting to rob the museum, they suddenly found funds to then up their security. The security at it was an improvement, but it was still lacking compared to what other museums had at the time. The security systems they put in at the time included 60 infrared motion sensors, a CCTV system with four cameras at the perimeter, and a few extra security guards. But remember, I did say it was lacking. I say that because there were no cameras put inside the building, due to the Board of Trustees believing it would cost too much. Also, the only way the police could be called to the building was by a button under the security desk. And other museums at the time, though, had a fail-safe system which required the night watchman to call the police every hour to make sure everything was okay. By 1988, they had a security audit, and the audit said their security was up to par with other museums, but like I said, it could use some improvements. But because the museum was strapped for cash, and it was against Stuart Gardner's wishes for the major renovations, the Board of Trustees did not approve for any security enhancements. Now, onto the heist. On the early hours of March 18, 1990, two thieves dressed in police uniforms parked in a hatchback car near the entrance. It was St. Patrick's Day, and a few patrons who actually witnessed these thieves in the car just thought they were real cops. Inside the museum was 23-year-old Rick Abbott and 25-year-old Randy Heston. Abbott was a regular night guard, but this was Heston's first shift on night duty. Part of the security protocol was that one guard would make rounds around the museum to make sure everything was okay, while the second guard stayed back in the guard booth. This, once again, is because the guard booth had the button to alert authorities in case there was an emergency. Abbott, the nighttime regular, went on patrol first, with Heston staying back in the security booth. During Abbott's patrol, fire alarms went off in different rooms. However, Abbott could not locate any fire or smoke. Abbott returned to the security room and then turned off the fire alarm control panel due to him believing it was some sort of malfunction. He then went back on patrol, but before he did, he made a quick stop at the side entrance of the museum and then briefly opened the side door and then shut it again. He didn't tell Heston that he was doing this or why. Once Abbott completed his patrol at 1 a.m., it was Heston's turn they swapped places. At 1.20 a.m., the thieves drove up to the side entrance and rang the buzzer, which connected them to Abbott in the security desk. Abbott could see them on the security camera and they were wearing cop uniforms, so he just you know, thought they were cops. And the thieves explained that they were cops there to investigate a disturbance. Well, Abbott didn't report any disturbance, but he thought since it was St. Patty's Day, maybe someone had climbed over a fence and they just saw it and they were trying to investigate and help out. So he buzzed the thieves in at 1.24 a.m. Once they were in, they made their way to the security desk where Abbott was. And then they asked him, hey, is there anyone else in the bill. Abbott told him that there was another guard on patrol, and so then they told him to radio him back and get him back to the desk. After that, Abbott noticed that the mustache on the taller gentleman seemed a little fake, but then the thief told him, hey, come out from behind that counter. You look like you have an arrest warrant out. So Abbott stepped away from the desk, which contained the only button for them to contact the authorities. Once he got out from behind there, the thieves then handcuffed him and placed him against a wall. Heston then soon arrived, but he was also handcuffed. And that's when these cops revealed that they were thieves and they explained to them that they were robbing the place. The thieves wrapped duct tape around their eyes without asking for directions, led them to the basement where they were handcuffed to a steam pipe and a workbench. The thieves took the wallets from the guards, looked at their ID and examined them and then threatened them. But then they told them, do not tell authorities anything and they would get a reward in about a year. It was now 1.35 a.m. It only took the thieves 15 minutes to subdue the guards. Infrared motion detectors tracked the thieves' movements throughout the museum. The first room they entered, the Dutch room on the second floor, did not have any steps recorded until 1.48 a.m. This was 13 minutes after they subdued the guards, 
possibly to ensure that the police were not alerted. As the thieves approached paintings in the Dutch room, a little alarm would go off. This alarm usually told, you know, patrons that they were a little too close to the paintings. They smashed the hell out of them. At 1.51 a.m., one thief continued to work in the Dutch room while another entered the short gallery, a narrow hallway on the opposite end of the second floor. Soon, the other thief then joined. The last stolen work was the chest to Tony from the blue room on the first floor. But even though something was stolen from the blue room, the motion detectors did not detect any motion within the blue room during the thieves' time in the building. The only footsteps that were recorded that night in the blue room, per the infrared sensors, was Abbott during the two times he passed through the gallery on his patrol earlier. The thieves then checked on the guards one more time before they left, making sure that they were comfortable. They then went to the security director's office and took the video cassette that had been recording on the closed circuit cameras, as well as all the data printouts from the motion detectors. But the movement data was also collected on hard drives, which they might not have known of because they didn't touch them. The thieves then proceeded to remove artwork from the museum, opening the side entrance doors once at 2.40 a.m. and then once at 2.45 a.m. The heist had only lasted 81 minutes. When the next guard shift came in in the morning, they realized something was wrong whenever they couldn't get in contact with the security desk. They called the security director who then came with his keys to unlock the building. They walked to the guard desk and saw that no one was there, so they immediately called the authority. The cops got there, searched the museum, and found the guard still tied up in the basement. 13 works of art were stolen, and it's regarded as the most valuable museum robbery of all time. The FBI estimated that in 1990, this hall was worth 200 million, but then it was raised to 500 million by 2000. Some of the art dealers estimated the work to be 600 million by the late 2000s. The mix of the items stolen puzzled the experts though. Some works of art were stolen were very, very valuable. While then the thieves would pass more valuable art to steal less valuable art as they were walking through. Because Gardner's will stated that nothing in her collection either be sold or bought, empty frames from the stolen painting still hang in their respective spots throughout the museum as placeholders for their possible returns one day in the future. The museum raised a $1 million reward bounty for anyone who had any information that was then raised to $5 million in 1997 and ultimately $10 million in 2017. The reward is for any information that leads directly to the recovery of either some or all the items, as long as they're in good condition. Federal prosecutors have also even said, you know, whoever returns this will not be prosecuted. The statute of limitations expired in 1995, so the thieves, as well as anyone involved, are get, would get away scot-free. But now that we know a little bit about the heist, who do the authorities think did it? Well, the FBI got involved immediately due to the possibility that the artworks could have crossed state lines and therefore would become a federal case. The authorities didn't have a lot of strong evidence such as, you know, footprints or hair, but they had their theories. I'll go over the first one. Rick Abbott, the night security guard. Because of his suspicious behavior on the night of the theft, he was investigated early on. While on patrol, Abbott, remember I said, opened and closed the side door, which some believe were to signal the thieves that hey, it's time to go. According to Abbott, he did this on a regular basis though. He said he was doing it to make sure the door was locked. However, one of Abbott's coworkers told journalists that if he was opening and closing the door like he says he does all the time to check it, that the managers would have seen it on their computer printouts and told him, don't do that. Also, the museum's motion detectors didn't detect any motion in the blue room during the 81 minutes of the heist in which the thieves were there. However, a piece of artwork was stolen from that room, and the only one who had motion in that room, per the detectors, was Abbott during his patrol. And what you're thinking, well, maybe the motion detectors were faulty or something. Well, several weeks after the, the theft, a security consultant examined the motion detector equipment and determined it was working, it was fine. The FBI released a security video from the museum the night before the theft in 2015, which showed Abbott buzzing in an unidentified man and having a conversation with him at the security desk. Abbott told investigators he didn't remember the incident as well as he didn't recognize the man in the video. So the FBI turned to the public for help. Several former museum guards identified the stranger as Abbott's boss, the museum's deputy security chief. That's strange you wouldn't recognize him. Despite all this evidence, Abbott maintains his innocence. And the FBI agent in charge early on in the investigation concluded that the guards were too inept and foolish to commit the crime. Maybe we got the usual suspect situation going on here. Another possible suspect was Whitey Bulger, the leader of the Winter Hill Gang, 
was one of the most powerful crime bosses in Boston at the time. He claimed he did not organize this heist. In fact, he was kind of pissed about it. He sent out agents to find who caused the robbery because it was on his turf and he wanted to be paid tribute. Bulger's involvement was investigated by the FBI agent Thomas McShane. He concluded that Bulger's close ties to the Boston Police Department could explain how the thieves obtained legitimate police uniforms or that real police were arranged to pull off the heist. Maybe those thieves were really caught. Bulger also had ties to the Irish Republican Army or IRA and the IRA's calling card was the bogus tripping of fire alarms prior to a heist according to McShane. Both organizations had agents in Boston and both had a history of pulling off art heists. However, McShane's investigation to Bulger and the IRA yielded no evidence linking them to to the heist. Side note, there was also a letter written to the museum in 1994 from an anonymous author who claimed to be negotiating the return of some of the artwork. The author claimed that they were the middleman and the thieves wanted the money to be sent to an offshore bank account to hide the identities of everyone involved. They told the museum to place a coded message in the Boston Globe, and so they did, but the anonymous author never wrote back. But in 2013, the FBI reported with a high degree of confidence that they knew who the thieves were and that they were a part of a criminal organization based in the New England area. Then in 2015, the FBI stated that these two thieves were deceased, but did not give up names of individuals that they were thought responsible, only that they were a part of the Merlino gang. Merlino's gang had cased the museum in 1981 and had plans to rob it, but the FBI found out about this and tipped off the museum. Museum. Remember I mentioned that earlier. There are three names for the Merlino gang that come up when you research this topic. They are Robert Garente, Robert Gentile, and David Turner. The final suspect though, however, I'm gonna to cover today is Bobby Donati. Robert Donati, AKA Bobby Donati, AKA Bobby D, is what I'm gonna call him, was a member of another crime family before his death in 1991. His involvement in the Garner theft was suspected after notorious New England art thief Miles J. Connor Jr. spoke with authorities. Connor was in jail at the time of the heist, so we can rule him out. But he suspected Bobby D. and criminal David Houghton were the masterminds behind the heist. Connor claimed that he worked with Bobby D. in previous art heists and that the two went to the Garner Museum together to stake out the joint. But Bobby D. was really interested in robbing the place. Connor also claimed that after the heist, Houghton visited him in jail and told him that him and Bobby D. planned it and they were gonna get the paintings to get Connor out of jail. And if this was true, they most likely stole this idea from Connor himself because Connor had previously returned stolen artworks to get his sentence short. Connor suspected since the eyewitness statements didn't match Hewton and Bobby D's appearances, <laughs> the two just contracted the job out to some lower level gangsters. But within two years of the robbery, both Hewton and Bobby D were dead. Hewton had died from some illness, but Bobby D was abducted when he was leaving his home and his body was found later beaten and stabbed to death. His death remains unsolved, I guess just as this heist does to this day.